Hi, how are you doing, Abhishek? Excellent. How are you? Doing great. And uh, how was your trip to India, Munish? Oh, India is always fun. No issues. It was perfectly fine. Excellent. Excellent. So, Munish, uh, I think we should start. Uh, are you ready? Sure. Excellent. So welcome to the Treasury Elite Entrepreneurship Series. Time and again, we bring in world-class speakers and business leaders across the world in the field of entrepreneurship, treasury, hedge funds, VC, private equity, and conduct various programs and webinars and conferences in different formats. Treasury Elite Entrepreneurship Series is one such format where we learn from industry thought leaders about their experiences of running their businesses, opportunities and challenges they encounter, and broad global trends they see for the future. Good morning, everyone. I'm Abhishek Goenka, founder and CEO of IFA Global and Treasury Elite. We bring in one-stop FX, treasury, and wealth solutions for companies in India over the last 18 years. And today we have Mr. Monish Pabrai with us. Monish is a founder and managing partner at Pabrai Investment Funds, the CEO of Dando Funds, and the author of Dando Investor and Mosaic Perspectives on Investing. Monish and his wife, Harina, started the Dakshana Foundation with the goal of recycling most of their wealth back to the society. Good morning, Monish. How are you doing today? Doing great. How are you doing? Excellent. God has been kind, Monish. So, Monish, uh, my first question to you is, uh, what's your approach towards investing in global markets, Munish. Yeah. In case a person needs to build a global portfolio in the current environment, uh, what are the countries one should look at? And how should he design the global portfolio, assuming he can invest in most of the markets? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the answer for most people is to uh, index and uh, and if if a person in india were to just buy uh, you know outside india two broad indices the s&p 500 and the msci uh, i think that's uh, assuming they have a long enough time horizon if they're young and so on uh, that's pretty much all they need to do you know the, the frictional costs are low and uh, uh, you can add to it as you need to and um, it works well Completely agree with you, Monish. Uh, a lot of discussions lately have also been started uh, that, you know, since index investing has been in vogue, and of course, the global thought leaders have talked about it so many times. And the PE multiples of investing, uh, the index at times have increased a lot. Maybe, you know, people are talking about that active management might again come in vogue for at least next two, three, four years. Do you, do you feel that uh, it's a little overrated in the current context? Uh, I think the issue is that uh, if you if you look on the active uh, management side, um, picking picking a good investment manager yeah. is much harder than picking a good stock. Right. So the odds are very high that uh, you know the typical investor will make a mistake in terms of the selection of the investment manager. And uh, ninety-five percent of investment managers, you know, historically have lagged the index after their frictional costs. So, I think that if one is kind of doing an SIP approach or dollar cost averaging and so on, then I don't think that's uh, much of a concern in terms of, and I don't think one should think in terms of two three years anyway. Uh, so I think that's probably a, a simple way to go is to go with the broad indices. And anyway, if you are young and you're earning, then you will anyway deploy over time. And uh, so that should be fine. Right. It's worked in the U.S. and I think U.S. has proved it the best. In India, I think in the large cap category, I think we almost 80% underperform. Maybe in the mid and small cap category, I think uh, still there is some overperformance in terms of active managers in India. But I think, yeah, I, think I think in, in India, you might, want to look at the small cap index or the mid cap index mm -hmm. or um, you know maybe split it between small and mid cap 
Right, right. So, Monish, uh, now there are two approaches of investing which is widely uh, taken across the world. One is a multi-country, multi-asset allocation. And the one is where, where you can just buy an index ETF, get an all-equity portfolio with the best stocks. So, assuming a family office is looking at a, say, a 5-6% return over inflation in the long term, which is a better risk-adjusted approach from your experience? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, this is an area where uh, there is a free lunch. And uh, so as you go towards more advisors and more sophisticated strategies, um, the odds of beating the simple index go down. And uh, and so the you know you know Charlie Munger says that if he lived in Peoria, Illinois, and he owned the McDonald's franchise, and he owned the Ford dealership, mm -hmm. and he owned the best apartment building in town, let's say he owned those three assets, he said he'd be happy putting one third of his wealth in each of those and be done with it, and uh, and so. When you look at that type of allocation, uh, one can argue that it's not ge geographically diversified, uh, which is true because it's all sitting in one town. Uh, but the odds are extremely high that he would end up with a great result. Okay. And uh, and and so I think people get in the way of themselves by overly complicating things. Agreed. So I would say the default should be an index. And then if you run into something which is, you know, just a no-brainer that is, you know, better than the index or whatever else, you're able to buy a McDonald's franchise at, you know, five times earnings or something. Uh, you could take some of it and put it into that franchise, for example. So uh, I would say make the default the index and then um, anything else, you know, the bar is a lot higher. Right, right. 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 So, Monish, uh, in the current environment, you know, when uh, interest rates across the world have gone up so much, and we had a pretty good bull run in the last 13, 14 years, uh, without major drawdowns, which actually stayed, you know, it just went up because of printing. Uh, there is a huge, uh, there's a camp which talks about that interest rates and taking duration for some time, maybe an eight, 10 years duration, would start uh, you know, giving better returns and equity and large money has moved also into debt. So what's your view, Munish, on this uh, that shift which is happening because of higher interest rates? Well, you know, I've been an uh, equity investor all my life. Uh, the history of investing in uh, debt instruments has not been a great one for investors in terms of their ability to stay ahead of inflation. Mm -hmm. So, so generally speaking, I would just think that if you had, if you, you know, were looking at a short time, you know, one, two, three, four years, then yeah, one should not look at equities. One should look at uh, some type of, uh, you know, very safe fixed income. Uh, but if you have a longer time horizon, then I, I would still be on the side of uh, being in equities. So you, so you feel that earlier they were running a 70, 30, 80, 20 portfolio, probably move it to a 50, 50. And then once you know you get better valuation, make it again to a 70, 30 or 80, 20. It, or... it depends on, uh, I think it depends on your age and time frames. Right. But uh, I would not put half in fixed income, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I might, I might ease it into the market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even if I put, even if I put half in fixed income, I would say, okay, you know, put a certain amount into the index every quarter over the next 10, 12 quarters. And then hopefully after that, you still have earning power and right. uh, you can keep adding to it as you go along. Right. And in terms of countries, Unish, uh, of course, India and US, the two countries have always performed well. 
But any other emerging country you feel it should be part of your asset allocation if in case you are running a global portfolio? Well, again, it gets down to the issue of uh, being able to pick managers and stocks. And uh, and that, I think, is a fool's errand for most people. No, I'm talking so, about index. Just in case you buy a China ETF or you know any other ETF. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the country-specific ones. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that if you did the MSCI, you did the S&P, I think that's giving you some very good, uh, good diversification globally, and right. uh, some very very strong businesses. Right, right, right. No, just to just to give you an example, which might uh, uh, kind of crystallize that is there was a um, there was a notion in the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies in the U.S of investing in the nifty 50 not the that indian is. nifty 50 but at that time this is like you know yes, that yes. more than 50 years yes and yes. the uh, the theory uh, was that these companies were so strong and so good that you really didn't need to worry about what you were paying for you could Correct. buy them yes. at any price i think um, i think some version of that is practiced by uh, Saurabh Mukherjee in in India. You know. Yeah, yeah. And buy Asian paints at any price, and yeah, yeah. Speed light at any price, and so on. Yeah, which yeah. I think is heavily heavily flawed. Yeah. But going back yeah. to the Nifty Fifty in nineteen seventy, um, there's a little bit of controversy whether Walmart was part of the Nifty Fifty or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people believe that. Walmart was part of the Nifty 50, and some people believe it was not. Mm -hmm. If Walmart if Walmart was part of the Nifty 50 at that time, and uh, the other um, 49 stocks in the Nifty 50, so you did a 2% allocation to each name, yep. to the 50 names, 2% into Walmart, and then 2% to everything else. If the other 98% went to zero, and the only thing you had that that continued was Walmart, and you held it till today. You beat the index by several percentage points. Okay. With mm -hmm. uh, ninety eight percent of portfolio going to zero, which didn't happen. I mean, a lot of those stocks were very overpriced, but they didn't go out of business. Some of them did go out of business, but many of them didn't. And so, basically. When you look at an index like the S and P five hundred, um, you know it's a it's a market cap weighted index, so it's not that every stock has equal weight. But let's say you go back in time and each stock in the index had a weight of 0.2 percent, you know, because there are five hundred names. Um, the story would be similar, maybe not to the extent of you know things going to zero. But what would end up happening is that maybe there'd be 10, 20, 30 businesses out of that group, which would truly shine. And they would become much larger weights. And so in an index setting, uh, the people who run the S&P 500 index, they do make changes every year or every other year, but they usually take out the companies that are long in the tooth. Like mm -hmm. they might take out a GE, but they won't take out an Amazon. Right. Or Microsoft or or Google or something. Uh, so they're generally taking out businesses which it's pretty clear that their time is done, right? And and even those movements are very small. So in an active portfolio, no one held Walmart for fifty years, other than the Walton family. Hmm. And in a active portfolio, hardly anyone has. I mean, Bill Gates himself almost has no Microsoft stock. I mean, complete, almost, I mean, Steve Ballmer's stake in Microsoft is many times Bill Gates' stake. And Steve is not the founder. Right. Uh, and so even the founder, in the case of Microsoft, did not keep the shares. Mm. And it's done extremely well. So I would say that when you go down the road of active management, uh, the ability of the manager you choose 
to stick with these great businesses through thick and thin is few and far between. Indeed. So it's unlikely to happen. And then you have a lot of frictional costs and all of that. So that's why I think that indexing gives you a free lunch. It appears that if you pay less, you should not get as good a service as if you pay more. But in the investing business, you pay more and get less. I 100% agree with you, Monish. And I've been a strong proponent of index investing. The very unfortunate part is that you know people have this stereotype bias where when they see a star fund manager, they just get, it gets glorified. And even they're okay to pay a 2% fee. Which obviously, we know that when it compounds for 15, 20 years, you know, it takes away a lot of your gains. You know, but you know how do how do people get rid of that behavioral bias? That's a very important point you can address. Well, you can lead the horse to the water. You know, you can make them drink. So, I think you can you can give people the the data and the logic and the empirical evidence. And that, but beyond that, you know, it's up to them. And you have a lot of very good salespeople in this industry. Right. And, you know, a manager who has a good track record uh, can use that to raise a lot of assets. Mm -hmm. And the future may not be as good as the past was. Great, great, great. Monish, uh, you know, we were just doing some observation and uh, we saw that whenever the interest rates are going up in the US and once the Fed has pivoted and once the rate cut starts, major drawdowns in equity markets happen. You know, this time around, the Fed has still not pivoted and maybe we have some more time before the interest rates top and after that, there would be a cut maybe uh, six months or one year later. Munish, that means that we are still way, way behind the, the drawdowns in equity markets, what do you feel? Well, you know, like I said, if you go back to the Walton family holding Walmart over the last 50 plus years, how many actions has the Fed taken hmm. in the last half century? And what type of interest rates have we seen in the last half century? and they took no action and they did really well. So at the end of the day, I think that it's very difficult to predict on a macro level, what happens with interest rates, what happens to equities as a result of those interest rates. And if you are in the great place of having ownership of a great business like you, you bought some McDonald's franchise in Peoria, you know, the Fed moving the interest rate or whatever else, you know, what impact is that going to have on your business and what impact is that going to have on your business after five years? Right. And uh, the owners of these businesses, they don't see the correlation, mm. right? I mean, mm. Owning a McDonald's franchise and or owning Walmart stock or owning Amazon stock, they're all the same thing. It's uh, it's basically where I think your um, it's probably the one proven way to build wealth is to buy into a great business at a reasonable price, and mm -hmm. uh, and so as long as you've done that, and the and the S and P five hundred. I mean, if I look at it today. Um, I don't think it's overvalued and I don't think it's undervalued. I, I think it probably looks just fine. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in hindsight, we'll be able to tell whether that statement is accurate or not, but it's not like uh, an obvious bubble is. Yeah. Uh, those are really strong businesses and uh, they, they deserve to be, uh, in many cases, valued the way they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Manish, in your in your journey of investing, and uh, you have authored so many books, and must have experienced a lot of uh, instances. So two, three, four things that, of course, index is one you mentioned. Two, three, four things which you want to give a message to people. You know, just fixing those things. The other ninety percent, keep it aside. 
what are these three, four things if you want to keep and you want to focus so that which you have learned from your investing uh, journey? Well, I would I would say that uh, maybe I can just give a a, a brief story. Um, and uh, this story is uh, almost 400 years old. So in uh, 1624, uh, just 399 years ago, um, the uh, American Indians who lived in the, what is the now the island of Manhattan, um, agreed to sell the island to the Dutch settlers in that place for $24, in the, the equivalent of $24. And that deal was done and the Dutch bought the uh, you know, wilderness island of Manhattan at that time. And, you know, people hear that story and they think, oh, the Indians got taken. You mm -hmm. know, they gave away this extremely valuable uh, real estate uh, for nothing. But let's say the Indians, and this was a story Warren Buffett's uh, mentioned one of his letters in the 50s to his partners, but let's say the Indians had a trust officer and the trust officer was told by the tribe, listen, invest this money for the benefit of the tribe. We don't really need it. And let's say the trust officer was able to get a 7% return on that money uh, over a long period of time. Now we have something known as the rule of 72 uh, which gives us a quick way to know how long money takes to double. Right. Uh, if you do 72 divided by seven, it would take about 10 years for that $24 to double to $48. And then it would become $96 in 20 years, $192 in 30 years, and so on. If you take a 100-year period, uh, which is 10 doubles, it's two to the power of 10, and two to the power of 10 is 1,024. So let's throw away the 24 just to make the math easy. But the $24 at 7%, 100 years later would be 24,000. And then 200 years later would be 24 million. And 300 years later would be 24 billion. And 400 years later, be 24 trillion okay and we are one year away from that at seven percent so maybe it's like 22 and a half trillion or something you know today now what is all the land in manhattan worth today um excluding the buildings and stuff, just the undeveloped land the whole thing was sitting undeveloped well we know that the entire wealth of the United States, the entire wealth of the world is 500 trillion. The entire wealth of the United States is 125 trillion. Undeveloped land in Manhattan is not 20% of US wealth. Right. It's a much smaller number than that. Right. It wouldn't even get to a trillion, it'd be much lower than that. So the Indians did not get taken. Because even at 7%, they would have more money than what Manhattan is worth today. So the reason for saying this story is that there are three things that matter with investing. Uh, the first is the amount of capital you start with. The second is your rate of return. And the third is the length of the runway. So we saw that in the case of the Indians, they started with a very small amount of capital with a very large runway right. and a below S&P annual rate of return. And they still ended up with a spectacular return. Now, if you go back, let's say instead of 1624, the deal happened in 1524. And you know, it's 2,400 cents in 1624. 
it would be the same math if it was 2.4 cents that they sold it for in 1524. So they could have sold the Manhattan for less than three cents. And the end result is still the same. And if you go back a few more years, you can say it would be down to one cent and you would still get the same result. So if the runway is long enough, the starting amount doesn't matter. It will still become a large number. If your uh, rate of return is low, but the length of the runway is very long and your starting capital is high, again, you'll end up in the same place. And if the length of the runway is short, then you need higher amounts of initial capital and higher rates of return. Now, when you ask Mr. Buffett, you know, if you could have any one wish, um, he always says that the one wish he wants is that when they look at his corpse, they should say, man, this guy was old. So he wants to live for a long time, not because he enjoys life particularly, I think he does, but he wants to increase the runway to as long as possible. So in the case of Warren, uh, the compounding started when he was around 20 and now he is 92. So the runway so far has been 72 years um, and it's going, it's still going, so that's fine. And uh, so I think that what people should keep in mind is that understand the rule of 72, because that gives you a shortcut way to know how long things take to double. Uh, understand that a tortoise can win the race, uh, even with a relatively low returns, as long as the runway is long enough. And so I think the single, single biggest variable that would affect outcomes for most people in terms of their investment results and so on is their savings rate. So it's not so much finding some whiz bank manager, putting it in some whiz bank fund. Uh, I think if you put it in an index fund, you have low costs. If you have a high savings rate, and you continue to add to it at a pretty prolific rate, uh, that would have more impact than anything else. And the other thing is that the savings in the early years are a lot more valuable uh, than the savings in the later years. And um, so I I remember that my, uh, my daughter, when she was uh, 18, she had just finished uh, high school and she had done an internship and uh, you know she was living at home and didn't have much expenses so she made about five thousand dollars during the summer uh, from the internship and uh, I asked her I said look if you have this five thousand dollars then let's say you were able to grow it at 15 percent a year which is higher but let's say you could do 15 percent a year it's a small sum so if I had asked her what would be the amount when you are 68? So 15% rule of 72 doubles every five years. And from 18 to 68 is 50 years. So you get 10 doubles. So 10 doubles means that you have again two to the power of 10. So that's a thousand. So 5,000 becomes 5 million. So just from one internship, she would end up uh, with a single significant amount. And then if, when she was 19, if she saves more and 20 and so on, but the early years make a big difference. So this is, I think, what people should keep in mind. I think Monish explained the concept of the formula of compounding very well, where both principle and the time is extremely important. You know, the first time, this is really important. That's a great takeaway, Monish. Uh, Manish, uh, you have authored many books also. Any any major takeaway from those books apart from compounding that you want to take this to people oh, from all of you? Well, books? the the books were on investing, and I think the um, the Dhando investor is really really taking kind of one line. There's a quote from Buffett, which where he says that I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman. 
and I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. Mm -hmm. So we have some really good entrepreneurs and business people in India. Um, what they may not realize is that the brain cells that they use that make them great at business are the same brain cells that can make them great at investing. Uh, because they both look at the same models. They look at the same things. And uh, so I think that the Dhandu investor was basically bringing up that, look, here's the frameworks that business people use when they're running a business. And a similar framework could be used um, basically by individuals, uh, you know, where if you're a business person, you have a pretty big leg up versus someone who's on an MBA and never run a business before um, in terms of, you know, picking your spots and so on. And um, on the other hand, if you are a really good investor, it gives you a lot of models that would be helpful if you start a business. And so the interplay between the two is interesting. Uh, so that's what uh, uh, the Dhando investor kind of focused on. And Mosaic was uh, really a collection of articles I wrote over a couple of years, just put together in a book format. So it's really a bunch of chapters that don't necessarily kind of connect from one to the next. Uh, but I think that they are good mental models uh, to keep in mind. Uh, so for example, one of the things in Mosaic is I talked about how the funeral business uh, is a really good business. And there are many different kinds of funeral businesses. For example, um, we have in the United States, we have the Delaware courts, uh, similar to, I think, NCLT now in India. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, there's a whole ecosystem of lawyers and advisors and lenders who work with companies that are going through restructuring and bankruptcies and all of that. Um, those quote unquote helpers do really well. So, because they are either involved in the burial or rebirth of companies. And, and so there are many different kinds of businesses which are kind of like the funeral business. So, um, you know, TJ Maxx is a retailer in the US. Yeah. They, they, they buy excess surplus from other retailers. So if you go to a TJ Maxx store, every time you go to a store or go to different stores, the type of inventory they have changes. But there may be some jeans that some retailer overordered that maybe cost them $15 a piece or something, and they would have sold it at $50. And TJ Maxx may might have gotten the whole shipment at $7. Right. Um, and they may put it on sale for $12, for example. And so TJ Maxx has done really well uh, while the retailers, which are department stores or clothing retailers, historically in the US, they have for the most part ended up bankrupt eventually. So because TJ Maxx is in the recycling business, it, it does well. So these the mental model of understanding funeral homes and understanding that those types of businesses don't attract a lot of competition uh, leads them to become better businesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Kunish, you have run a fund uh, and you have had made some mistakes and I would take this opportunity to ask you that one or two major mistakes that you made which you don't want people to repeat. If you could cite some examples out of it or give some takeaways from there. Sure. I think that uh, John Templeton said that even the best investment manager or investment analyst hmm. will be wrong one out of three times. Right. And probably for most of us, we'll be wrong half the time. And the, But this is a very forgiving business. You know, I pointed out to you that 
if you bought the nifty 50 and only walmart was left and the other 98% went to zero you still had a great outcome and in fact if if we look at a investor in india who recently passed away rakesh junjunwala uh, you know he had put like 4% of his net worth into titan industries a few decades ago and when he passed away now you know rakesh was a split brain in the sense that he held some things forever and everything else was rapid fire trading and uh, the four percent tight in position ended up being more than half his net worth Agreed. and he did nothing he just held it and all the other stuff he kept doing throughout his life was the other half so if everything else had gone to zero for rakesh uh he would still have been a multi-billionaire in dollars so uh, anyway so it's a forgiving mis- uh, business but what we have to understand is that we are going to make mistakes. Uh, there's really no way to avoid them because we are trying to project futures of businesses and futures can unfold in very different ways. Uh, the important thing is to not dwell on it too much, is to learn, learn and understand and then not repeat that. So one, one area that I've had a lot of difficulty and I've had multiple uh, times where things have gone wrong is investments in banks and leverage financial institutions. So during the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, I owned a uh, mortgage lender in the US called Delta Financial. And uh, basically that whole uh, world went upside down. And uh, Delta had these you know, warehouse lines of credit, they were violating covenants, they end up in bankruptcy and eventually it was a zero for us. Mm-hmm. And it was a it was a bet that was a 10% bet. Usually when I make a bet, it's 10%. Mm-hmm. So we were we were managing about 700 million at the time. And I think we took a zero on 70 million. And that repeated itself a couple more times. Till I learned that uh, just don't invest. So I think one of the issues that comes up, like I've had trouble with banks as well. So the issue with you know these companies like the banks and uh, lenders, NBFCs, and so on, is that for the most part they are black boxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have loan level data. Uh, we don't have the granularity to know exactly what's in their books and what's going on. The Reserve Bank knows that, but we don't. And uh, and any business where cash leaves the door when you make a sale, like a bank gives a loan, the cash has left its its uh, its premises. Right. Then they have to hope and pray it comes back. That's not a good business. Mm. You know? So what I learned the hard way was that for whatever reason, I don't do well investing in levered financial institutions. And so what I did is I basically said, okay, um, all banks are off limits. All NBFCs are off limits. You know, all uh, lenders of any kind are off limits. Um, I also found that in studying the mistakes of other investors that um, highly indebted companies were more likely to have problems than not. Basically, if you're running a business where you don't have debt uh, and you hit a downturn or a you know bad patch, it's unlikely you can be taken out right. because you have, you have staying power. But if you have a lot of leverage and you're tripping covenants and so on, then that becomes an issue. So... Um, so one change I made was that I just, anytime someone pitches some bank to me, I'm done in like five seconds. Mm-hmm. If I look at a business which has a lot of leverage, basically if a business is really good, they should be able to make a lot of money without borrowing money. Correct. That's the, you know, like Visa or MasterCard or uh, Coca-Cola and so on. You know, These companies don't need any debt to make a lot of money. So it's a hallmark of a great business if it can generate high returns on equity for the long term without taking on debt. Um, 
a bank a bank does well because it borrows basically 10 10 to 15 times the capital it has and then if it makes a decent spread on that money it's a great business right you know but it can go in reverse you know if it doesn't do so well the capital can go to zero right so so those lessons surprisingly took many decades to get sunk in for me but they finally have sunk in so that's good uh, like Buffett says, uh, old too soon and wise too late. Uh, but basically, you look at uh, you look at businesses, uh, you look at your mistakes, and you try to understand was data available before you made the investment that could have stopped you if you had thought to think about those factors. And in many cases, the answer is yes. Uh, what happens is the greed part of our brain takes over and we see the upside in something while discounting the downside. And so that's something one has to always be careful of in investing is uh, look for what Ben Graham would say is the margin of safety. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's another point why I think Joel Greenblatt in his book has, in his magic compounding method, Banks and financial institutions are missing. I yes, we've taken that out. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, I think I think both are problematic. I think because it's uh, uh, you know with insurance companies you get these fat tail events that show up and then there's a problem. Hmm. 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 Right. Manish, last question to you. Uh, tell us about your journey on Dakshina Foundation. And tell us about some of your initiatives that you have taken lately and any message that you want to give uh, to the people based on the foundation and its activities. Well, I I think uh, Dakshina has worked out vastly better than I would have ever, ever ventured to guess. So it's been, it's been a good outcome. Um, basically, I, I knew probably... I would say maybe 16, 15, 16, 17 years ago that uh, we would end up with a lot more money than we could consume in my lifetime. And um, large inheritances in general do more harm than good. So you're not really helping your kids which by giving them an IV drip in their arm for the rest of their life. That's not generally a very helpful way to go. So I knew that I wanted to really, because of no choice, recycle it back to society. But I also understood from Mr. Buffett that giving money away is more difficult than making it, uh, especially giving it away effectively. So I wanted to start early. I wanted to start experimenting. I wanted to make the mistakes that I was going to make. And uh, so Dakshina got started when I was in my early 40s. And, um, and I thought probably waste 10, 15 years in India just with people ripping me off and everything else. And then I would figure out what to do. And that was, from my point of view, the tuition bill to pay. But actually, we got traction from day one. Uh, so our model worked. We had cloned our model from a guy in Bihar, you know, Anand Kumar, who runs Super 30. And I think the government is giving him a Padma Shri now, which is great. And... Um, so we, we identify very poor kids who are gifted uh, and we prepare them for these competitive exams like IIT and medical and so on. We, they would not be able to you know, afford it. And in many cases, they're in rural India. So there is also nothing offered. And uh, we've had about six and a half thousand kids go through our program in the last uh, 15 years or so. And uh, you know, about 4,000 odd of them have gotten to IIT or med school and so on. And even the rest have got to like some good engineering colleges and so on. So it's uh, it's worked out well and uh, we are trying to grow and scale it. So it's it's been great. Excellent, excellent, Monish. So Monish, you have been uh, sitting with the great investors, you know, Charlie and Warren Buffett. Two, three conversations that you have with them all the time regards to investing, which have always stayed with you. What are those? I mean, if you could just share. 
investing well i i would say the thing that i've observed and learned from both of them is that they fixate a lot on the downside hmm. um they a lot of investors get excited about the upside hmm. uh, their minds i mean just observing them the way they are wired they immediately start looking thinking about what can go wrong hmm. and what they're looking for in investment investments is they're looking for total no brainer so they're looking for opportunities where the odds of things going wrong are very low they still make mistakes but what i learned is that if you put your focus on the downside which is the opposite of venture investing you know mm-hmm. venture invest you ask yourself what possibly could happen on the upside mm-hmm. and you're you know you're more of a dreamer uh in terms of what great things could happen this is the exact opposite where you're questioning yourself repeatedly on what can go wrong so that's what i think is uh, kind of the margin of safety that they talk about and then the circle of competence you know okay mm-hmm. since you since you mentioned venture investing uh, you know just you know uh, of course we know that last 2 3 years 2 years has been pretty difficult for them and uh, uh, so do you really feel that private market investing is better than public market investing or public market investing will always win in the long run i think venture investing is a very difficult game mm. uh if you look at the all the different venture capital funds in the us the results of the top 2 or 3 or 5% of firms versus the rest in the industry is night and day and if you look at the top quartile versus the bottom quartile there's a very large difference if you look at the top 5% versus the next 5% it's a very large difference so uh whereas if you look at different bond fund managers hmm. between top and bottom there'll be almost no difference hmm. um so so venture i think is a very difficult asset class i think because to do well you would need access to fund, uh, funds that probably are very difficult to get access to agreed agreed and then the funds that you would get access to are and probably not in the top 5% agreed agreed great thanks thanks monish thanks so much for your time and taking out today and if i can be any use to your foundation I'd love to participate with myself and my team any point of time uh, all right which, which part of us you are monish i just stopped the uh,